Some people have asked whether ME is different in different parts of the world. Um, you know, certainly there was an initial myth that um, ME was more prevalent among yuppies, among kind of people who are white and who are kind of higher income. Um, that myth is not true. Um, so we actually know that ME tends to be more common among individuals who are kind of lower income. So that is a big important thing. We also have found in the United States that ME tends to be occur more often in minorities, um, of people of color. So yes, um, we've also done a community-based study in Nigeria, and we've actually found rates of ME to be higher than in the United States. So we think ME occurs um, in many different places around the world. In terms of which particular groups have higher rates than others, we're not sure, but certainly in the United States we found some differences and certainly um, people of lower socioeconomic status are more likely to have this illness. Whether ME is race related is something that <clears throat> we really don't understand well. <clears throat> Some of the symptoms of ME, for example, orthostatic intolerance, do seem to be different in African Americans versus Caucasians. Um, but in terms of us being able to definitively understand what are some of the factors, it's unclear. Um, we did find, for example, Latinos um, in the United States had the highest rates of ME than any other group, and particularly among women Latinos versus men Latinos. So that was kind of interesting. We also found that um, Latinos who had been um, more acculturated, who had been more into American society, had differential rates than those who had not been um, acculturated. We do think that um, genetics probably makes certain people predisposed toward having a lot of chronic illnesses, and ME is probably a good example of that. Um, we still have a lot more research to be done on that, but I think eventually we will be able to conclude that. Um, that's my guess. In terms of whether ME is somehow um, higher in per particular groups versus other groups, um, you know, I think that that's something that future research will be able to better understand. Um, I think at the present time, um, you know, we still are trying to understand some of the risk factors for this illness. So basically, to, to the best research that's going to help us understand some of these genetic markers is to actually look at genetics in, in healthy people and, and look over time to kind of see, you know, which ones uh, develop ME and which ones don't, and then look at some of the risk factors, both environmental as well as biological. That's really the way we're going to disentangle kind of the genes versus environment and see the roles of these different things. There have only been a few long-term studies involving individuals with ME. Um, it does seem like individuals who have longer illness tend to have more cognitive difficulties and more symptoms. Um, I think that, um, you know, we actually have a paper that we're working on now that's trying to look at people who have had this illness for a longer period of time. There really aren't a lot of studies that have um, been published in this area, um, but it does look like um, length does increase some severity issues. Patients with ME have functional impairments as severe as any of the major illnesses, including cancer. Um, and on and on in terms of different very significant chronic illnesses. So these are very sick patients, patients who really need the best of medical care and patients who are often provided the worst. So we see some of the worst functional areas that people have is just physical capacity to do things, endurance, stamina. That's probably the area where people have the greatest limitations, sometimes cognitive confusion where a person basically can't remember things or can't remember why they're doing something. Uh, and that often creates it very difficult for a person to be in a work setting. Um, so yes, the, the physical impairments of being able to kind of do things consistently over time and then the next day continue to do that. You see lots of impairments, um, particularly for these post-exertional type testing um, and cognitive challenges too um, seem to really make it very difficult to think and remember things and to focus on things. So yes, there are neurocognitive and post-exertional functional impairments that we see in patients.
economic analyses have been sometimes done. And in, the, in America, um, our group has estimated that the cost might be up to $20 billion a year um, for the types of problems that patients have with ME. But the real cost is to the patient. The patient who basically is in a system that they have one of the most severe illnesses that we know of and are actually provided the least comprehensive treatment. So here's individuals who have one of the most difficult problems we can think of, and they're questioned about the validity of whether they really have an illness. Can you think of anything worse than a personal cost of being so sick and having people question whether you really are ill or not? Funding by the government has been um, very low levels. Um, and what's needed is really kind of places that you can go to to get diagnosed and treated. Um, and these in the United States generally don't exist. Um, so if you have cancer or if you have MS, you can go to specialty clinics and you can get the best diagnosis and the best treatment. But for example, I live in Chicago and there really aren't physicians who are specialists who treat patients with ME. Um, and that's a problem. So we need to have the types of health care that involve services that are available to patients. And right now they don't have the services, nor do they have the research dollar investment to provide the types of data that we need to find out what treatments, what pharmacological treatments are most effective with patients. So yes, in both the research arena and the service delivery arena, we're basically provided very low amount of resources given the severity of this problem that affects our populations. In terms of what can be done for patients with ME, I actually spent the last year writing a book called Principles of Social Change that Oxford University Press has published. And in that book, I really try to indicate, you know, what other social change movements have done to bring about change, including the civil rights movement and other types of groups like the women's movement. And ultimately, it's endurance. It's staying committed to something over long periods of time. It's basically having community coalitions that work on trying to really deal with the power abuses that occur. And it's really looking at some of the structural issues that need to be faced. We need to organize. We need to be more effective. We need to basically be able to change the status quo because the status quo is not working for patients with ME. And it's only by us collectively being involved in action is really the situation gonna change. As it has, I might add, for many other illness groups, particularly the people with HIV AIDS, who really have demonstrated that it is possible to bring about a sea change for treating and appreciating people who have that illness. We need social support for patients that involves the family, parents who basically protect their kids, guardians, spouses, parents who basically are able to stand up for the rights of individuals who are sick, and also people in educational settings as well as social service settings, medical settings, and also within work settings to basically provide for the special needs of patients. And we all have to recognize that first thing, this is a legitimate illness, and we have to be willing to accept some of the limitations that patients have. And we have to also validate their experience and work with them in terms of what they need. Individualized approaches are critical. So it's really the entire social network has to be mobilized. And that might involve the person's brother or sister, the person's father or mother, the person's grandparents, the people who work at their church, the people who are the medical associates. Everybody has to come together in a team that basically makes their life kind of more livable and actually has the respect and services that they need to make a quality of life. To bring about change is going to involve not just the patients who have ME, because many of them are sick, but it's also gonna be involved the people who are well the people who care, the people who are spouses. It's gonna involve a social change movement of people saying, we're not gonna take it anymore. 
we're going to make a change. And it's going to be thousands and thousands of people working together to say, this cannot exist the way things are. And that's going to be the start of the social change movement that's not going to be in one country, it's going to be in multiple countries. Heeft u een vraag naar aanleiding van deze video? Reageer op YouTube of tweet naar het MECVS Vereniging of mail naar wvp.me-cvsvereniging.nl. Uw vragen worden zoveel mogelijk behandeld in de chatsessies.